Hi. Okay. We're live. But I just remembered I don't have my 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 wonderful light here. But never mind. Never mind. That was me rushing around trying to get ready. But um, you can see, right? You can see. How are you all doing? I just saw a comment by somebody saying, I'm in London, my kitchen is seven degrees. It is so cold. <laughs> but also it's it's cozy jumper time. I quite like that. Okay, let's just see who is in the house. And uh, we have France. Bonsoir. Uh, Washington, USA. Good morning. Good afternoon. We have Leeds. It's freezing. Yep. Uh, good morning from that under. What? Norway in the house. Canada in the house. Portugal in the house. Bo, bo Norte. Hi from Sweden. Hello, Sweden. I have to learn how to say hello in Swedish. Um, I know tak. Tak, is that high? Because in Polish, that's thank you. Anyways, uh, Denmark in the house. Australia, Michigan, Lincolnshire. Portland. Oh, Portland. Interesting place. Finland, wow, Wales, España, hola, que tal, buenas noches. Uh, hi, Gott Kveld. I'm guessing that's something Swedish. Italy, oh, buonasera. Okay, is there anybody from Greece? I want to show off my Greek. <laughs> Kalinista. Anyways, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, right, just checking my tea. And we do we have any Dutch people in the house? Goeie avond. Zijn er nog Nederlanders hier? Um, okay, oh wow, nice and busy. Hello, Leslie. How are you doing? Um, okay, wow, that's great. Nice, thank you. Thank you all for joining me. So, NVF555, good evening. Um, so this evening is called, or this live stream is called, um, what is it called? <laughs> Big Trend Story Time. Hi, tapes. Um, and that's because of this book called Transpositions. You may have heard of it, uh, heard of it, you may have heard about the book already. Um, this is compiled and edited by Sarah Fillimore and Al Peters. Uh, Al is better known by his name of Moly or Mole at the Door, who does such fantastic um, photoshopping and creates memes and just creates fantastic, um, uh, such funny artwork and illustrations and all these things for us to... To be able to have a laugh in these times of darkness and craziness. Ooh, too hot. Now, this book uh, doesn't show up that clear. Uh, it's available on Amazon. And look how big it is. I was really surprised when I got my hands on it. Like it's a proper book. Look at that. Um, so it's called Transpositions, Personal Journeys into gender criticism. And this is full of stories by at least 115 different people, most of them anonymous, all sharing their uh, different perspectives uh, and experiences of coming to a point where they thought, what the fuck is going on? Um, and why they couldn't just um, be quiet about it anymore. And I've been reading it uh, for a couple of days now. It's it's quite addictive when you when you get going because you just want to hear more experiences, more uh, perspective from different people. Uh, some are women, some are men, some are parents, some are gay, some are straight. So there's a whole. It's very rich, and there's lots of things there to that you can relate to. Uh, that we all can relate to, I'm sure. And there's a, a couple of common themes. So I would recommend everybody get it. And I'm also very happy that uh, um, my contribution is included in this book on page 265. 
So I call it the day, the day I found my rage. Um, there is one in here that sounds hilarious. What was it about mermaids? I thought mermaids was a swimming club. <laughs> I haven't read that one yet. Um, so I'll be reading a couple of stories about this uh, from the book, just to give you an idea. Um, and Sarah and Al told me they were very happy for me to do that. Oh, I just had a hello from Hawaii. Oh, my days. Aloha all the way from Hawaii. Oh, and Liverpool. Okay. <laughs> from Hawaii to Liverpool. Peking all around the world. Still too hot, but I want it. Mm. Um, now, last Friday, exactly a week ago, there was a book launch. There was an event. And this in itself, what happened, shows again what, what crazy times we're in. So Sarah Fillimore organized uh, the book launch for this with Al, and they hired a venue. And then they advertised it on Eventbrite. Eventbrite pulled it. Um, and now Sarah Fillimore is taking Eventbrite to court. Then the venue itself said to Sarah, okay, you can have your event here, but please do not publicize that you're doing it here because the venue were afraid. Um, apparently the reasoning that Eventbrite gave uh, about not wanting it advertised was to do with safety and that people, uh, they wouldn't be able to guarantee people's safety. Uh, what were they expecting? Lots of crazy people to show up um, and assault women. Well, I guess that's not completely unfounded because we've all seen what happens um, at the events here in the UK, what happened at uh, Kelly J's tour in the States, which was just complete bonkers. I mean, from what I've seen there, what happened in the States is like whatever I've seen here, but on steroids or in most cases on estrogen. It was just completely, absolutely mental. Somebody says, how can you have an, an event without advertising where it is? I saw a couple of things on Twitter where people are like, oh, where is it? Uh, and Sarah's like, yeah, sorry, I can't say. So it all has to be via direct messages and on the quiet, um, which reminds me of this whole thing of, of, of being back in the closet again and in the 60s and the 50s and the 70s, uh, gatherings for, for lesbians and gays all had to be in secret. Uh, it is absolutely, absolutely mad. But um, the event was very successful. It was a great evening. I think we had about between 50, 60 people there, um, about five, six speakers. I was one of the speakers as well. I sang the Y chromosome live, which was fantastic. I, I haven't done any of this stuff live, you know, uh, in a performance sort of setting. And that was just so much fun. So without further ado, oh, actually, Somebody's asking, when is the doc coming out? Um, a documentary? I don't know. Which one are you? Let me know, what Mary, what it is that you're talking about. Um, oh, the Kelly J. Keene documentary. I can't wait for that. Somebody says it's the 16th. The 16th of December? That'd be very quick. Um, okay, so one thing that I've been working on uh, for the last week at least, um, is a video that I'm going to call uh, What I Got Wrong About Trans. So I've been doing quite a bit of research and I'm writing the script for it. Um, hi, Ellington. How are you? Somebody asked, are you vegetarian, Mr. Menno? No. <laughs> I could not be less vegetarian. <clears throat> I tried. I tried going vegan for like a week or two weeks and uh, I probably went about it. In completely the wrong way and I came out it thinking I've never loved meat more so sorry 
sausages, steak, bacon, oh, chicken. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> VFF555. Yes, absolutely. Menno loves his meat. What can I say? Um, I'm making me blush. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to do a, a video where I looked at the key misconceptions that I had that initially made me very um, sympathetic towards um, the so called trans rights movement. Um, But as I say, these will be based on misconceptions. They're very, very common misconceptions that people hold. So I thought if I can do a video where I highlight these three, then other people who might see that and who are sort of new to this might go, oh, but, uh, ooh, well, I thought, that's, I thought the same thing. So it's about getting to these three key concepts um, that a lot of people have the wrong idea about. And then once you once you start going, actually, I was wrong about it. Then hopefully that will um, open their eyes and see what's really going on. Um, so I've been working on that. I've split it into three parts. I've scripted and researched the first third. I'm using quite a lot of clips, so I'm having to sift through lots and lots of videos, and that's taking quite a bit of time. Um, Misty Cat says, men are lost pepperoni pizza. Oh, hell yeah. I just bought one and it's in the freezer. Right? No. Okie dokie. So hopefully I'll get this video ready. Oh, I really want to get it out by the end of next week, if not sooner, but there's a few other things going on that I need to focus on. Um, and I had this idea of because it's all about going down this rabbit hole, maybe I should, you know, like an Alice in Wonderland, maybe I should dress up as the white rabbit <laughs> from Alice in Wonderland. Um, and uh, there's a costume place on Monday. So I'll go and have a look at that costume there. So uh, I, I, I always think I'll just try and keep it simple, but I never managed to do it. Anyways, um, it is. I've been talking for 12 minutes already. So how about we start with the first story from trans positions. I'm going to just, I'm just going to read them while I read them. I'm not going to look at the chat. And there are so many stories in here. There's about 115. So I, I'll only read like the short ones. Otherwise, um, I'll just go on forever. So here's one that I picked. I hope you're sitting comfortably and hopefully warm. Let's start with this one. Let's just go straight in. Boom. Okay. This one is called My Autistic Daughter Declared a Trans Identity. Most of my life passed without any need to be gender critical. I have no idea when this term even emerged, or rather, when the need for such a term arose. I come from a working class family. Nearly all of my family relatives were what might be considered gender non-conforming. They behaved in ways that came naturally to them. They dressed how they liked, and some fought to get into male-dominated positions. One was a firefighter. One was a construction worker. Several had fought as partisans in the Second World War. What is a woman? Well, anything she damn well pleases. A message I raised my daughter with as well, not knowing that what she pleases to be might include a man. I was vaguely aware of the existence of transsexuals, but had never met any personally. The first time I became aware of gender ideology was when I was participating in an internet group for parents around 10 years ago. A fellow member had discovered that her teenage son had been stealing her panties when she caught him masturbating in them. She took him to therapy. The therapist told her to support her daughter. He didn't even identify as female or declare a trans identity. 
He said that he liked the thought of having breasts surgically implanted, but had no interest in hormones. He said it was a fetish. The gender therapist insisted he was trans. This mother sent me distraught messages after distra distraught message after distraught message, not being able to discuss her fear, worry, and panic in the larger group because they shut her down for not being supportive again of her daughter. Daughter. After a while, this mother disappeared from the group, and I later heard that her marriage had broken down and she'd moved far away. The issue had demolished her family. Weird, I thought, and sad and twisted. And yet still, it didn't touch my everyday life in an entirely different part of the world. Now, I'm in the same boat. My autistic daughter has declared a trans identity after feeling rejected by society and living her life online during the pandemic. I've raised her the way I was raised, with an invitation to wear what she likes within the budget and to do whatever she likes, pursue whatever interests she likes. A series of internet searches about feeling bad about life and puberty led her down this rabbit hole very suddenly and in a very trance-like manner. I love her. I want her to be safe. I know her. I see in her the young ideologue that I once was, ready to defend her ideals to the death if need be. I am terrified. I do not believe this is an organ organically formed identity. I think she's confused and hurting, and trans offers all the answers she so desperately wants. I'm living with someone who feels like a complete stranger, and my home feels like a verbal minefield. The upside is this. In my country, no doctor will give her surgeries and hormones until after years of very regular therapy. I didn't join the wider debate. The gender critical battle is fought within my own family. And I better not say anything or I'm a turf and a transphobe and not a good person. I bite my tongue and I pray. I pray that I'll have my daughter back someday beautifully non-conforming and beautifully herself, in an authentic self discovered through life and not online. I pray even though I'm an atheist because I'm discovering that I'm powerless to do much else. Um, by Anonymous. Right, so there's about 115 of those. <laughs> so if you get this for Christmas, get yourself a box of tissues. Uh, right, this is just one story, but it shows what an impact this can have in different people's lives and how it just pulls the rug from underneath your feet. And I wish this writer, this woman, all the best. And I really hope that her daughter can come to terms with herself as she is. Right, let me just have a look at the chat. Lizel says, I was told submission should be short. Oh, well, um, yeah, me too. I was given a, 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 a word limit. This one is not too long though. Look, it's just, it's just, sorry, just, that side and then uh, just over a page and a half um, there there are some that are much much shorter than that and there are some um, that are longer mine's only one page I think um, okie dokie let's do another one sorry Whoa. That's quite a long one as well. Um, 
Okay, this one is called Grumpy Radical Feminist. Uh, VF555 says, read yours, Mano. I'll, I'll get to mine in the, in the bit. I'll do a few other people first, a few other ladies, I should say. Um, okay, now this one is by Andrea Nobra, who is uh, from Brazil, and you might know her from Twitter. She also self-published a book called The Grumpy Guide to Radical Feminism. Okay, here we go. Grumpy Radical Feminist. What brought me to the GC battles? I am a... Hello, hello, Jan B from Trinidad. Welcome. Um, I'm just reading out some stories from Transpositions. Jan, this is the second one. What brought me to the GC battles? I'm a child sexual abuse survivor, born and raised in Brazil, who was constantly educated by society that women were not oppressed anymore. But I questioned everything, like sex stereotypes, women and men's social roles, and especially why I was sexually abused. Fast forward to 2011, when I was denied medical assistance for three days while having a miscarriage at 16 weeks. I nearly died, and the negligence and the total lack of information about miscarriages had a profound effect on me. Before, I would question and look for answers, but after that, I started questioning men in authority besides looking for evidence. When I got pregnant again, a female friend told me all she knew about obstetric violence and asked for help to raise awareness. I've been an activist for birthing women since 2012. I had no clashes whatsoever with trans activism until 2016, when a 16-year-old girl was gang raped in Rio de Janeiro by 33 men. The year before, an Indian female medical student was gang raped by six men and also impaled dying from the injuries. I was questioning even more, and friends introduced me to feminist theory to help me to understand why I was sexually abused and why 33 men raped a 16-year-old girl. At the same time, I started to see trans activism in action. At first, it was as a tolerant bunch fighting for social justice, and I was ready to embrace it when some of the same friends told me that women were banned from a Facebook for natural gynecology because they objected to being reported and cancelled by men in the groups who were forbidding these women from talking about female issues. At another point, another story came to my attention where men who say they are trans went to a feminist conference and were allowed to use female toilets. After the event, some of these men went to social media to claim that radical feminists synchronized their periods with the aim to offend the men who say they are trans, and that the female toilets bin were full of dirty pongy tampons. I recognized the misogyny in their speech and went deeper on the roots of female oppression, reading all I could on the feminist theory slash radical feminism. That's when I fell down the rabbit hole and found out about masculinists, sissy porn, fetishes, paraphilias, autogynophilia, big pharma, big tech. And finally, I peaked for good. Since then, I started charting female oppression around the world as evidence that not only women are oppressed, but also that female oppression reaches all women on a global scale, regardless of social class skin color, or even self-declared male gender identity. Since starting my thread on female issues, I also delved into writing about the feminist theory, and in 2020, I self-published a book called The Grumpy Guide to Radical Feminism. That is Andrea Nobre. I hope I pronounced that. Okay, so these first two stories, I, I didn't... Um, Put them in order to read, but they're a bit intense. But one thing about picking that I think that we can all sort of relate to is when you say I've peaked, it sounds like it's just one moment. 
whereas it's more of a, a process with stages, stages of peaking. Um, and I find that even when you think you've peaked, you, there's always more times where you peak. There's always something else. Um, it never ends, it seems. Um, I liken it to uh, climbing a mountain. Um, so if you think about climbing Mount Everest, there's different base camps. And these base camps represent different stages of peaking, um, if you like, where, you know, sometimes when you're talking to someone and, and you're on different pages, it, maybe that's just because they're, they're in another base camp, but that doesn't mean that that's where they're going to stay necessarily right let's read oh it's also got pictures in the book by the way uh there's a section with different different images okay okay i think this one has a title that we can all relate to it's called Overwhelmed with Information. It was 2020, and during lockdown, also, right, sorry. As I was reading these stories, I thought this book is, as you know, intense. And, you know, it's, it's obviously not happy reading a lot of the time. But I thought, what a record. This is such a good record of of an awakening taking place. And I really hope that this is like the first one of many, that many, many more people are gonna speak up um, and get their stories out there. Okay. It was 2020 and during lockdown, I was home with my teenage son, swishing through YouTube videos when Kelly J. King, standing for women video came up. I didn't know who she was or what the subject matter would be, but she was asking that we send happy birthday wishes to JK Rowling because she needed support. I was intrigued as to why this would be the case. And so I Googled JK and found her now famous tweet about people who menstruate. So back on Twitter, I went to follow JK and to send her some love. I didn't really think any more about it for a day as I tried Twitter before and not really got on with it. But when I went back for a look, blimey, when people talk about falling down a rabbit hole, that's how I felt. I was overwhelmed with information about the erasure of women's language, spaces, sports, etc., and the transitioning of children. I kept on following people and the information just kept coming. I couldn't process it all and struggle to sleep at night. How come I haven't heard about this before? Is it real? I felt guilty that I hadn't been taken notice and I took a week off social media because I was so stressed. But then I got angry and realized I could not ignore what was going on. So I began educating myself with more videos by Kelly J, Glinner, and Peak Trends, and what a steep learning curve it was. I never really took any notice of politics or feminism. Like many women, I thought the war for women's rights had pretty much been won. Since then, I have been busy writing to my MP, signing petitions, filling in surveys and consultations, gone on a protest, bought merchandise, and given money to countless crowdfunders, stuck up stickers and flyers, handed out flyers in the street, helped with research, joined the Women's Rights Network, and complained many times to the BBC and Ipso. It takes a lot of brain power and sometimes money. We shouldn't be having to do this, but at least now the tide is turning, and maybe there is a light at the end of this nightmare. Okay, that's by Anonymous. So, the other good thing I think is when you're well, when you're reading this, is that you're, you're so, you can sort of plot when different people started to 
to peak. You know, some quite recently, 2020, some 2016, some 2014, some even further back. Um, and you can pick up lots of tips from others on if you want to get involved, what you can do. Like this, this lady here has, has got involved and done loads of stuff. Natat says, I'm in the Irish Midlands and boy, is it cold and very slippery. Be very careful. It's going to stay cold for a while, I think. Okay. Right. This one is called Back into the Ring. I reached peak trends in steps. Initially, the furore over rolling gained my notice. It struck me as extreme. I mean, death threats? So I dug a little. That meant reading her essay to see if she was hateful, transphobic, and promoting genocide. All I could think on reading it was, hold on, why are people upset about this? What I read was thoughtful, moderate, caring, and compassionate. I watched every women's competition in the fields where I'm active, non-sporting, um, sorry, let me just read that again. Oh, I watched every women's competition in the fields where I'm active at a clause allowing those who are identifying as women. Meanwhile, every organization or group I looked for to for support with my health issues began centering the idea of an inner sense of gender. Groups I accessed for work and personal interests also felt like dominoes. I began having discussions with people I knew. I got brush-offs at best. I don't see how it's a problem. And aren't there bigger issues to focus on? And abuse at worst. The usual, turf, hateful, unkind, complete with online unfollows and blocks. I cried. It hurt. And I retreated. I reflected, read, and soon realized I could not turn away. I could not remain quiet when the impact of gender ideology was so vast. So despite the fear, I stepped back into the ring. Good for you. And this is also anonymous. Again, just to see how many of these stories are anonymous shows how difficult it is to, to come out with these things publicly. Just just normal things. Plain facts things. Absolutely bizarre. Right. How are you feeling about this story so far? Let me just have a look at the chat somebody says there is no way in hell in the industry that i'm in that i could come out as a turf <sighs> i know it's just mad um okay right I'm going to do mine. Somebody says, I like hearing the stories. It makes me realize how similar all our experiences are. You know, it, it is. There is so much here. I mean, as different, you know, we're, we're a very motley crew of people if, if we have to see ourselves as, as a group. Um, we come from all walks of life, all ages, uh, all experiences. Um, but there is so much, there are so many common threads running through this um, that we can all relate to. Um, and from these stories that I've read so far, it's the emotions in it. It's so heavy. Also very rich. Um, And, um, and here's mine. So, 
Mine is called The Day I Found My Rage. My peak journey started off in pink sequin hot pants and kitten heels on the 6th of July, 2019. It was London Pride and I was darting around as Theresa Gay, a special incarnation of my Theresa May act, handing out leaflets for an LGBT plus campaign related to Brexit. It was there that I first saw the mantra, trans women are women, um, on a huge banner as the parade went by. I was puzzled by it. Why would anyone claim that trans women were actual women? I went online to find out more, and before I knew it, I'd slipped down the rabbit hole into gender woo-woo land. It was a crazy place where everything was turned upside down. But thankfully, I found the videos of Magdalene Burns and Peach Yogurt, as well as the voices of other women to help me cut through the madness. I began to see the inherent misogyny and homophobia at the heart of the trans movement and its harmful impact through policy, law, and the subversion of language. These were the early stages of my peaking. After about six months, I began to realize how, had I been born a few decades later, my 15-year-old self would have probably embraced this gender madness as a way out of misery. Shy, insecure, depressed, and at times suicidal, a mobile phone with Tumblr or TikTok would have quickly proved that the kids at school had been right all along. I wasn't actually a guy. It would have explained the bullying, the difficult relationship with my dad, why I never fit in. Off to mermaids, I would have gone, magical gender identity in hand, to be greeted by Susie Green. And we all know what would have happened next. But my actual peak came in February 2020, and violently so. I'd been working with a therapist for about a year and a half, trying to piece myself together as the memories of certain experiences had gotten the better of me. These experiences were all rooted in me being a certain type of male. The kind that both the general world and the gay world doesn't always look too kindly upon when masculinity is held, held in such high esteem. One evening, at the start of our session, he gave me a leaflet for a weekend workshop by another therapist. It was an experiential weekend for men to re-meet the boy they once were. Sounds great, I said. But then I turned it over and read, this workshop is open to anyone who identifies as a man. I scoffed. So the therapist asked me why. I hadn't even realized that I did that, you know. But that's when it happened. A rage I had never known began to pour out of me like a volcano erupting. I shouted, I screamed, I cursed, I cried. The therapist didn't know what was happening and neither did I. I just felt so utterly violated by those words, like a metaphysical rape was taking place. Here I was, a man who'd learned the hard way how my very maleness had been at the heart of so much pain, ridicule, and rejection, and was working my ass off to find a way to accept myself as the man that I am. Only for these words to suggest that a female can just opt into it? All the regressive social stereotypes I'd been struggling against for decades could now simply be worn as a costume by a woman or a girl and passed off as the same as me? No, no, never. I won't let my reality be somebody else's fraudulent identity. Hands off. It took me six months to calm down. By then, I had found my peace and my voice. And I decided to make 
YouTube video. So that was mine. Oh, Mary says, this is my son's story too. And you know what? I've never been the kind of person to stand up for myself. I mean, I have throughout my life, but I've I prefer to, or, or I've always always preferred to avoid conflict. Uh, I'm a bit of a doormat. I like to make sure everybody else is happy, and then you know it's easy to forget about yourself. And um, hey, Ali, how are you? In one of the therapy sessions, the therapist asked me, "What what do you want?" I didn't know. I had no idea how to answer that question. Because I always thought, oh, by the way, Ellie, I'll get in touch with you about um, keep turfing um, this weekend. Um, it's just how I'm dis dis disposed, I guess, all my personality type, whether that's through socialization or just just built in i don't know but um I'd, I'd rather avoid confrontation make sure everybody else is happy try to please other people and then um in dutch we say you you cipher yourself weg you erase your own number um and that's what i uh, have done for for decades you know i'm 46 now it took me to get into my 40s to start learning god i don't want to sound like a you know like a mama oh 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 but basically to to because you can't know what you want if you don't value yourself as a person and you don't deal with boundaries well and if you're always putting other people first um so that was a real interesting you know time working with this man to help me get to a point where you can say actually you know what I know what I want and this is what I want and and actually it's important enough for me to to say that that's what I want um and to not let other people walk all over you and just as I get to that point like being secure in yourself uh, and not letting self-doubt getting the better of you or fear of rejection just when I get to that point all this gender madness come along comes along so in a way, it was good timing. Um, sorry, I'm just laughing because Pinwheel Art says, apparently I used to be compassionate, but since I don't believe in gender souls, I am evil now. Well, we're, all, we're all evil according to, the, to this. Uh, and Al Catorda asks, Menno, how many friends have you lost but one back over this? Oh, that's hard to answer. Because some people have fallen away. Some have been, you know, very, have told me that they're unhappy with what I'm talking about. Uh, others haven't. They've just gone quiet. They've just sort of disappeared. Um, I wouldn't say I've lost someone who's then come back. But there have been people who at the beginning were like, why are you so invested in this? Why do you get so angry about it? But now they can see, they can see it themselves. Um, and that's why I thought of doing this video that I'm working on at the moment. It's about addressing those key misconceptions. Because uh, as soon as you dislodge those things, then people start going, hold on, what's happening? You know, do I want to go along with this? Now that I know that one, trans that no longer means having gender dysphoria, for example. Because most people, when they think trans, they think of the old school transsexual idea, right? A person who's got really terrible. Uh, feels really distressed about being the sex that they are. Uh, they want to escape it, so they go to extreme lengths, into uh, including medical steps, to try and change it. That's the old school idea. And isn't it bizarre how we're now at a point where you don't have to have dysphoria to be trans anymore. You don't even have to transition to be trans anymore. 
But when it comes to kids, they want to put them on the blockers as soon as possible. With the kids, it's always about the medication. But adults, no, you can be trans. You don't need to do anything. You don't even have to change your name or your pronouns. You don't even have to change the way you dress nowadays. Uh, it, it's become absolutely meaningless. And still, for the children, put them on the blockers. Then the cross-sex hormones. <sighs> Anyways. Um, right, let's read another one. Oh, so did I wrap that up in terms of my own thing? Stand up for yourself, basically. Stand up for yourself. Don't let anybody bully you into submission. That's the story of my younger life. I got bullied quite badly. And from the age of six, that's very young. And that went on until I was at least about nine or ten. Um, in those days, there wasn't any anti-bullying stuff in schools. And I was just... The lesson I learned from all of that is you deserve this. You deserve this treatment because teachers would say you're asking for it because of my because I wasn't a typical boy. The parents of those kids that used to it was like a, a group that used to come after me. Even the parents said, Well, you probably you, you probably asked for it. Like you you don't go out into the world as a six-year-old and go, Yes, please do this to me. It is such a crazy notion, it's, and it reminds me of, um, hey, Elder Aslan in the house. Oh, you're saying the same, same here, years of bullying. When, you know, I mean, this was in the, the early 80s. You know, I was six, so that would have been 1982 when it all started. And it just went on and on and on. Um, and I started showing signs of being very distressed. I, I started developing these nervous tics. Um, I kept wetting the bed until I was like 12 or something. That, but again, this is before the days of anti-bullying. This is before the days of, you know, child psychologists getting involved. But who knows, even if I met a child psychologist then and they were mermaids trained or gender intelligence trained, I can so easily see how I would have embraced all this stuff that's happening today and gone, that's me, um, and been banging on the, the Tavistock's doors, so to speak, for the blockers. Um, uh, so with a lot of these kids that are confused, I can totally see why. That's why they need good explorative therapy, not all this affirmation bullshit. Um, Pinwell Art says in response to VF505 I bet most of us not scared to speak up we're always misfits of sorts <laughs> I think that's quite a bunch of misfits in this movement <laughs> okay let's read another one um, back in the ring okay so here's one it's very short and oh Ellie says I was bullied too for my weirdness that I now know as learning differences and mental health, masculinity, etc. If I was growing up today, I'm sure I'd be put in the blockers. Uh, there are so many of us who can relate to these, to this whole not fitting in narrative. What is it that we're trying to fit in with? Instead of being you know, the, the, I'm not a parent, but if I was, I, I, I would teach my child to be themselves. Just be yourself, appreciate yourself as you are, and make it about your qualities. What are your qualities as a person? What do you bring to situations that is, that is unique to you? What is the content of your character? Instead of all this focus on the all these micro identity labels because uh, it, it the, all these labels they, they, they don't tell us anything about a person apart from the ones who are reaching for these labels they're reaching for something they're reaching for freedom you know freedom away from expectations from judgment from rejection these are things that we can all relate to and i really resent how 
these kids are being led down the garden path on that basis because that's when you're at your most vulnerable. Um, and they're using these kids' vulnerability against them. Ugh. Anyway. Okay, this is a short one, and I've read it three times, and it always makes me cry. It's called Another Side of Things. Oh, Ellington 3 asks me, are you the older twin? Twin? <laughs> are you the older twin? I'm the younger one. So, but only by about 15 minutes. So my twin was born and then I was born about 15 minutes after. And this was in 76. And the doctor at the time thought it was going to be just one, one big baby. Um, instead, there were two tiny ones. And we were so ugly when we were born. Somebody asked, are you identical? No, because she's female. <laughs> so <laughs> we couldn't be more, more different. Um, but we were both ugly babies because we were uh, seven months, seven months, yeah, two months premature. Uh, so went straight into an incubator. How heavy were you both? We were both just a peck of sugar. So a kilo. What is that? Two pounds or something? Um, just a kilo. We were, we were, oh, okay. So we were like a, the size of a ruler, you know, like 30 centimeters or something. Uh, absolutely tiny. And our skin was translucent. We had, um, God, we had all this weird hair on our cheeks. You could see our veins through our skin. My dad was like, are these aliens? <laughs> ah! And in those days, she went straight into the incubator. So my mom was worried that she wouldn't be able to bond with us um, by the time we get home. And again, because it was in the, in the mid-70s, they weren't allowed near the incubator either. All they could do was stand behind a window, you know, and, and look through the window and see a, a room of all these, these glass incubators. So ever since I've had Snow White syndrome <laughs> encased in glass. Anyways, we pulled through. Uh, they, did, they, they had some worries about me. They didn't think I was going to make it. But, you know, even in those days, I was in my little incubator going... I will survive. Anyways, so uh, this one's called Another Side of Things. It was early 2018. I lived in LA and I was posting on Facebook in support of trans bathroom bills in New York City. When I got a direct message from a friend I hadn't seen in about five years, she was a lesbian a mum, a kind of crunchy granola type. She said, I just wanted you to know that the issue isn't as simple as you think. I just wanted to know if you're open to hearing the other side. I said, yes, sure. Because to be honest, Caitlyn Jenner winning woman of the year did bother me. I had some nagging questions, but also had a belief that things would work out okay. And I really hate the phrase, rights aren't pie. I could never square that with the history of women fighting for their rights. Anyway, I said, yes, I'm open to hearing another side. And she said, here's a link to the cotton ceiling. And then here's Magdalene Burns' YouTube video. I'm so happy to read how Magdalene Burns is part of so many people's speaking stories. Lastly, she said, I'm deleting this thread. We can never, ever talk about this again. But I just wanted you to know. I watched those videos and I followed the link. And now I'm really trying to help as much as I can. She and I have never spoken about it again. I'm sure we've crossed paths on Twitter, but I have no idea. Ooh, and this line gets me every time. 
She was my gender critical lesbian guardian angel. And that's by MJ Austin. MJ, you do this to me every time I read that. I just think it's so sad. That this woman reached out to her and that it was such an important thing for her to do and that it had such an important effect and that they've never talked about it since. Like she says, she was my gender critical lesbian god and angel. Oh. And how all this woo woo creates such distance between people. So while at the same time these two connected, it was just like passing ships in the night and then it faded away. And I'm like, why can't you talk? I want to know, MJ Austin, if you ever watch this stream, get in touch with each other, talk, please. It just feels like such a loss. And like you say, that you've, you, you may have crossed paths on Twitter, but you have no idea. It is the saddest thing how this is driving people away from each other. You know, in terms of these friendships, I need to blow my nose now. Sorry, I just have to grab a tissue. Sorry, I'll blow it under my pants. <laughs> and we're back. Hi. Um, yes, how this, this gender rule disconnects people when they could be close. They could be strengthening their friendships and their relationships, but it tears people away from each other. Um, you lose friends. Um, it's it's women losing husbands, it's parents losing their children, and it, it doesn't just disconnect people from each other, it disconnects people from themselves, you know, where where all this woo-woo is confusing people and and they're thinking that they're not who they are or they want to be someone else and try to escape them else. All this stuff is about disconnecting. It it's disconnecting who we think we are from the reality of our material sex, the, the, the material reality of our sex human bodies. It's disconnecting us from that. It's disconnecting us from the natural world. It's disconnecting us from each other. It's just, it's all about disconnecting. That's why the way I see it, what we're doing is about reconnecting. And this book, is about reconnecting because it's all about joining the dots. So I very much see this this whole fight, the gender wars, if you like, sex versus gender. It's about being connected versus being disconnected. Anyways, just my thoughts. Right, how we're we doing? That's nearly an hour, ladies and gentlemen. Tips, you say you have a much nicer bedroom than Clive Simpson. <laughs> you know, I saw a picture of that bedroom and I'm like, at least, at least Clive is busting stereotypes here that all gay men have good taste. So thank you, Clive, for busting stereotypes. Man, what was going on in that room is like flower, flowery wallpaper and then a framed picture of a flower on the flowery wallpaper and some real busy pattern on the bedspread and, and pink everywhere. It was just like, like somebody just vomited confetti <laughs> all over the place. Um, anyways, but uh, I might be doing one of the things, one of the, you know, he does Queen's speech with Dennis Kavanagh, so... I might be a joint B guest. <laughs> and then uh, I shall tell him tips that you and I have issues with it. We're, I've seen other messages about it. It's quite funny. Um, 
Carolina Brennan. Carolina Brennan says, Magdalene Burns is who piqued me. She was beyond a legend. For me, she was a huge, huge influence. Um, somebody said, I was late to the live, but glad to have heard some. Thanks, Menno. Thank you, Reed. You can always, you know, um, replay it from the start. Um, okay, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one more, and then um, I feel like I fulfilled my obligations because I said pick trends story hour, and we've done an hour, so uh, I didn't want to do half an hour and then <laughs> be accused of false advertising. <laughs> Okie dokie. So. Let me see. This is quite a long one that I picked out, so I won't do that because it's it's just quite long. Um, for anyone who's just joined, these are oh s s s s s s is saying somebody posted your Y chromosome song on Discord last week, and I was like, lol, how is this not banned? I don't know. But some social media places have taken issue with it and sent me messages, and I've had to delete stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm surprised it's still up. Um, also, on Facebook, for some reason, the my video about Ricky Gervais for, versus Nish Kumar suddenly picked up steam again and is now on 431,000 views. I'm like, wow. I mean, obviously that happens with videos, um, but still for me, that's an incredible number. And quite a few people on um, my Facebook page has now grown and it's just hit 10,000 followers, which is great. Somebody says, I whacked it on Facebook. Oh, thank you. Um, and somebody, Chris B says, I watched Y chromosome in the weather spoons <laughs> just off of Brighton Beach. I was waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder. It did not happen. Oh, great. Well, I'm, I hope you listen with your headphones. Um, somebody else says, The Misgender Funk is my favorite. I loved working on that one. Uh, Al Katorda asks, Menno, do you and your twin sister observe your premature birthdays as well as your official ones? No. I never even thought about that. No, just our birthdays, which is the 19th of June, 76. So we're twins as well as Gemini's, which might I'd explain a few uh, <laughs> of our character, uh, characteristics. Um, okay, where was I? Where was I? I was going to read another one, right? Grumpy Radical Feminist, I've done. Oh, yes, and for anyone joining, I'm just reading stories about um, transpositions. Misty Cat says, lots of turf seem to be Aries. Actually, I have an Aries moon, apparently. Um, so maybe uh, that's where that comes from. And we have a Pisces in the house. Uh, I think, uh, actually, when I was in my early 20s, I would do readings. I, I would look at people's astrology charts, and I would make little booklets for them uh, about what it all meant and put pretty pictures in there. and. Uh, make it really nice. Um, I was really into it at the time. I used to combine the astrology with the numerology and then like spend a couple of days making like a bespoke individual book for, booklet for someone and then um, split it into two parts. So the first part is what is it that makes you tick? And then the second part is why are you ticking in the first place? So it's not like I ever... I believed in it as such. I just thought it's it's interesting as a frame of reference just to see what is it that you relate to, what is it that you don't relate to, because um, that tells you much more about who you are than just the text itself. Um, and at the time, I, I thought it was I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, so we have a, a <laughs> Scorpio in the house. So the Scorpios apparently are the psycho bitches of the Zodiac. <laughs> and only a Scorpio can ever un sort of understand another Scorpio. The rest of her are just like, what the hell is going on with you? <laughs> and Pisces, Pisces are the dreamers. I mean, if we're just talking at it in a, uh, you know, on a superficial level, um, the idea is that Aries is the first sign of the Zodiac. 
and Pisces is the very last sign. So that's why Aries, apparently, the, the energy is all very impulsive because it's all about beginning. It's about planting seeds and then getting bored and moving on. Um, whereas Pisces represents the move into the other world, you know, beyond the human material world. And that's why they're so dreamy <laughs> and not grounded at all um, and wishy-washy and feelings, uh, but also very hopeful. Um, I just think it's quite interesting, just as a frame of reference, not as a faith or an ideology type of thing. Um, when you also look then, because obviously the zodiac's uh, a circle, so every sign has an opposite sign. Um, Ellie says, "My, I'm such a dreamer. My mum used to call me Dolly Daydream. <laughs> Dolly Daydream. Funny. Um, so right, every sign has an opposite sign. So that's the that, that's the sign that will bring out the the best in you, but also the worst in you. But um, as I say, I just think it's interesting to look at all these different characters or qualities that are associated with these different signs, what complements another, what fights with the other, and how you can sort of use that as a frame and reference for yourself, you know, to see where your own strengths lie, where your own internal um, conflicts lie. You too, Kat says, I went from astrology, woo, to gender, woo. Now I'm woo free. Excellent. Okay, let's pick one other. Um, okay, I've read that one. I've read that one. I've read that one. Okay, I've done pretty good. Back into the ring, done that one, done that one. Ah, okay, here's one more. Oh, this is one is good. This one's called Head Enough. I'm sure that lots of us can relate to that one as well. Okay, so last story of the evening. Now, when somebody uh, merely says, apparently I'm some sort of special snowflake as I'm born on the cusp or something. I don't believe in astrology woo either. Okay, so when they say that you were born on the cusp, uh, that means you were born in the week where it changed from one sign to another. So in astrology, that is obviously, for example, you have Aries, then Taurus, then Gemini, then Cancer, then Leo, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't just, even though, in terms of the how we count it, you go, okay, Taurus, last day Taurus, first day Gemini, boom. Um, but the idea of the cusp is that as you get towards the end of Taurus, you know, the Gemini energy starts to seep in. And as you're in the beginning of Tor uh, Gemini, there's still some residue of the Taurian energy. So that's what they talk about uh, when they talk about cusp. Actually, I'm on the cusp of Gemini and Cancer which apparently is called the cusp of magic. And the day I was born is called the day of the spark. Anyways, had enough. About eight or nine years ago, I remember going to a gay women's network event, and it was hosted by a trans-identified man. At that point, I remember that I didn't mind them being there, but I was unhappy that they were in a position of authority. I remember feeling uncomfortable, but also was still very much part of the Be Kind Brigade. About four years ago, my ex-partner decided she wanted to take testosterone and identify as trans. She went from being a lesbian to calling herself queer. I struggled with it. I wanted to be with a woman who was happy being a woman. I resented how her journey and her identity was suddenly impacting my sexuality as she didn't like me referring to her as a lesbian or she. She wanted they, them. We split up not long after. We'd been together for years and the relationship wasn't working, but this was the final straw. Finally, when I started going on lesbian dating sites after that breakup, there were men identifying as women. Men with beards, 
who are clearly biological men. I was full of rage. I couldn't believe it. That alongside Stonewall, having the likes of Alex Drummond as lesbians was just so offensive. That was the final straw for me. And now my tolerance is zero for men coming into lesbian spaces, calling themselves lesbian and denying our sex-based reality, oppression and sexual orientation. I feel like the world has gone mad. I can't believe that people are bending over backwards for effectively a men's rights movement. It's misogynistic, homophobic, and incredibly regressive. We need to stop this madness, but it's exhausting when political parties, institutions, and corporates are buying into the narrative under the ages of inclusions, inclusion. Women and lesbians specifically are yet again at the bottom of the pile, and I have had enough. It impacts all parts of my life and has had a damaging effect on my mental health and well-being. Anonymous. There is so much in the story that I agree with. And again, we see the heavy toll it takes on a person, but also imagine that your relationship ends, you come out of a lesbian relationship where your partner doesn't even want to acknowledge that you're lesbians anymore. And then when you try to meet someone new, you're on dating apps and all you see is men. It is absolutely mental. I'm very happy that at least she got a chance to sort of get it off her chest and put it down and now has it published in this book so that we can read it and and I hope that she feels like she's not alone in this because obviously she isn't because she's here in this book with at least 115 others. I just read a comment from someone that I can't read out. <laughs> Via 555, you always get me in trouble. So, somebody says, Magdalene Burns should be here to see the fruits of her amazing work. Did you ever meet her, Menno? No, I didn't. Um, I came across her videos in 2019, um, and I think she passed away. In 2019, didn't she? So, it was probably just a few months before she passed. Um, hi, Abel, how are you doing? Hope you're well. Um, right. I'm going to leave it there, everyone. Um, I've read, how many have I read? About six, seven maybe. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and if you want to, to get your hands on the book, or you can gift it to someone for Christmas. I'm not being paid for this, okay? I just think it's a great book. Um, and it's really important that we know that all these stories are out there. Uh, as I said earlier, this is like a record of an awakening. Um, so, and Chris B says, please come back sooner, Menno. Um, well, I'm working on this video, so hopefully I really want to get that out next week. And there's another, oh God, there's so many videos. I've got at least 16 videos now. I've got a big list of the ones I want to make. I keep changing the order in which I <laughs> tackle them. Um, so Transpositions, uh, compiled by and edited by Sarah Fillimore and Al Peters, uh, a.k.a. Molly. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Somebody said that they couldn't find it on Amazon in the States. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, but Millie says, I've got it in my Amazon basket now. Woo, woo, woo. Oh, and you too, Kat. Thank you so much for your five pound. That's so appreciated. Um, I know times are, are pretty tough. Uh, energy bills going up. Everything in the shops is going up. Have you noticed? Oh, my God. It's just mental. Um, even my favorite pepperoni pizza has gone from 150 to 175. But, you know, in percentage terms. I know, that's a really cheap pizza. It's a really cheap pizza. It's Sainsbury's from the freezer. Uh, but I like it better than the Pizza Express one. Um, 
And just around the corner from where I live, I, I do eat good pizza too, you know. There's a, there's a small local pizza place where they just have such gorgeous, amazing. Oh, Chris B, thank you so much for your 10 pounds. And it says number one fan. Woo, 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 woo. Thank you. No, I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, it, it, it really helps, makes a big difference. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, uh, mm, pizza. Uh, and then I'll put Katora. How about a version of the Lego moving, movie, Everything's Not Awesome, entitled Everything's Transphobic? That's a great suggestion. Right, I'm going to just uh, Lego movie, Everything is Not Awesome. Oh, funny. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Uh, I think I've seen it ages ago. Um, so, thank you very much, everyone. I hope, uh, please sing a Barbara Streisand song. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Barbara! Oh, God. That, as if that's not challenging. Um, Okay, earlier I was talking about the importance of learning to appreciate yourself as you are. And she has a song about that. I think it's called I Want. And I won't sing, sing, sing it. <laughs> but I think she starts off singing. Okay, let me look up the, the lyrics and then I'll just do a little bit of that. Because I think this, this song for me in my, in my mid-twenties had a message that really hit home. Um, Barbara Streisand. Um, lyrics to I want. No, that's not the one. Right, it's called All That I Want. So it's a really interesting song. I won't do the whole thing. But she goes, I want a gown of diamonds, long gloves and sweet perfumes, hats made of silk and satins, sequin and ostrich plumes. I want to wear mascara, polish my nails real bright. I want to be an actress, actresses play all night. And for me, this was like why I was really drawn to drag in, in my late teens and early 20s, because I thought, wow, you get to wear these amazing things and you get to be on stage and people applaud you and you get attention. I felt really insecure as a guy, but I thought that in drag, you know, I would get all this validation. Um, and then she goes, I want to find my true love, like all the love songs say. I want to do what I want. I want to get my way. So it's all about, I want and the big dreams. Um, but then she, the, in the bridge, she sings, while dreams grow wise, wild dreams grow wise, when sweet childhood, oh God, I can't speak, when sweet childhood flies, time waved a hand, and the breeze blew the sand from my eyes. There's something here about growing up and becoming more Realistic, I guess. And then she sings, I want a gown of gingham. Diamonds would weigh me down. Pom-poms and plumes are pretty if you're a circus clown. Funny how black mascara streaks when the tears begin. And this line for me is the absolute punchline. Nail polish, rouge, and powder can't paint the sparkle in. The sparkle comes from the inside. That's where the sparkle has to come from. Not the makeup, 
not the sequin, not the performance, not the fake superficial stuff. It has to come from inside. And that only comes from when you truly, truly learn to accept yourself, who you are as a person, warts and all. And if there's anything I can give as a message to this world, that would be it. It's not easy. Lots of us will know how hard it is and how you can battle with yourself. But when you get to that place where you truly accept and love yourself as you are, then you've got a real solid basis. And if other things, obviously, life is not always plain sailing. But when you get a knock here or there, at least you're grounded and you'll be able to, you know, sway like a, you know, bend in the wind instead of cracking and breaking. So on that note, and then for the Barbra Streisand lovers, you can sing on a clear day, rise and look around you and you'll see who you are. On a clear day, how it will astound you that the glow of your being outshines every star. You'll feel part of every mountain, stream and shore. I don't know the rest of the words. Something, something, something. Never before. Okay, and then she does the big <laughs> Barbra Streisand roar, which obviously I can't do. But again, on a clear day, on a clear day, you can see forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And then a big, also, there's people upstairs, so I don't want to go too loud. And ever more. Um, that's, I mean, for some people, that's not like the music they're into and it's super cheesy. But on a clear day by Barbara Streisand. This is such a message of positivity. And I hope we all get to experience that because it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Leslie Farrington says, you need to do enough is enough about troons. Um, actually, me and Barry months ago in Manchester, uh, when we met Leslie, that uh, the day after I met Barry in, um, you know, the EDI Jester, we met in a, in a pub and had lunch and then we were just talking about you know how some women have these operations oh no what was it it was to do with basically muff muff is another word for vulva or vagina and um and and we were just thinking we should do a song to enough is enough a muff is a muff <laughs> and how gay men are not into that but anyways on that note i shall love you and leave you um have a lovely, lovely, lovely weekend, everybody. And thank you so much uh, for your super chats. Um, you too, Kat and Crispy. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. And um, hopefully then my next video will go live next week. I must get it out next week. So everybody, have a great weekend. And look it up on Amazon. Transpositions, Sarah Fillimore and Al Peters. Okie dokie, I'm going to end the stream now on a clear day. Rise and look around you and you'll see who.